perspective on the New Testament. And the only way you can win this is if your name is not, is in, has been registered. So if you don't want to win, you have a 100% chance to not win if you didn't fill out a registration card. It's sort of like, an, like the uh, bracket for March Madness. Even if you fill it out, if you don't fill it out and turn it in, you have no chance to win. Now, one other thing. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Alexander Bolotnikov, will... Um, Many of you may have seen this book, True Believer. If you came here tonight, you're going to get a copy of it. If you already have a copy of it, we're going to give you another one. And we're going to ask you to pass it on to somebody else, right? Because it's a story about a communist atheist who became a practicing Jew who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Okay? So when you leave here tonight, we're going to hand each of you one of these. Now, I would like to take a moment. Um, if you have filled out the form, if you would all pass it to the inside aisle. If you would pass it to the inside aisle, and if I could get um, two volunteers, Celia, will you pick up, and Gordon, will you pick up the cards? So if you just pass them to the center, and then we will have them picked up. And if you need more time, I'll give it to you. So while they're picking those up, how many of you paid attention to the, uh, to the election in Israel and Netanyahu got reelected, right? It's a hot topic, and we have a picture up here of Israel yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What is going on in Israel? And all of you received when you walked in a information brochure that talks about Israel in the Bible, and we're going to be talking about that. I'm going to take a moment here to invite up the pastor of Whipple Creek Church, uh, Pastor Ed Nelson. And I would like him to introduce himself, talk a little about the church, and then he's going to open with prayer for us, and then we'll continue with our program. Good evening. I am so glad that you have found your way here tonight, and I'm glad for those who are watching via live streaming. Uh, my name is Pastor Edward Nelson, and I have the privilege of ministering here in this congregation, and we're just thrilled that you're here tonight. Um, we're just asking the Lord to be with us here and to give uh, Dr. Bolotnikov the message that, would, that will draw our hearts near to him. And so I would just invite you to have prayer with me. If, if, let's, let's talk to our Creator. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love for us. Thank you that you that you have mercy towards sinners, and that you sent your Son, and that he loves us. Father, send your Spirit here tonight. Open our minds and our understandings, and open your word to us, that we might understand your great love for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight, and every night of the series, the, we are blessed we will be blessed with some great music. And opening our program tonight, we are privileged to have the lead mezzo-soprano from the National Academic Bolshoi Opera Theater of Belarus. I want to make sure I get it right, because when you hear her voice, you'll understand. She loves God. She flew all the way here from Minsk, right? So it's a little bit of a journey for her to be here with us and to, to perform for us. She's going to be singing songs in Hebrew, in English, and in Russian. And even if you don't speak Hebrew well, you'll understand the message. We also have also a great pianist, Elena Abel. We have two Elenas on the program tonight. And Elena was the director of music for Mona Morelos, was her last thing, and 
She is a great music. So I would like to invite both of them to the stage today to, for our opening song.
You know, that's a great song about longing for Jerusalem, written by a Jewish uh, writer and poet named Yehuda Halivi, and um, it describes his longing to be in Jerusalem. And hopefully, during the course of this series, as we talk about Israel yesterday, today, and tomorrow, you will grow to have a longing to be in Jerusalem in the city of gold. It is my honor now to introduce to you Dr. Alex Bolotnikoff. He uh, has a PhD from Hebrew University. He has a master's from Andrews University. He has spoken all over the world and continues to bring forth the Word of God uh, in a new and exciting way. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Alexander Bolotnikoff. Welcome to Israel yesterday, today, tomorrow. The subject is impossible to ignore for the last 15 years. I think I am not alone who realizes that since 2001, this world is in a state of a slow cooking war, and the way how, no matter how we look at this war, the initial beginning of this war The reason for the Al-Qaeda terrorism and the attack on Twin Tower was stated very clearly. United States supports Israel. So the topic is now impossible to ignore or to avoid. And there are divergent positions on Israel. If you look in the political spectrum, you have United States and Canada supporting Israel, whereas European countries not so much supporting Israel. And when you look for the reason why, you realize that behind this type of support or the lack of support, there is a long history of Christian attitude toward Israel and Jewish people. And the Christian attitude toward Israel and Jewish people over the 18 centuries of its development made the full circle from the early church fathers who believed that Jews are cursed and rejected through Martin Luther who basically supported the same position. It moved all the way into a 180 degree reverse where today many evangelical Christians voice their unequivocal support to Israel and Jewish people considering Israel as a center of the last day events and Jewish people as a 
specially chosen people by God, privileged nations, and uh, which has a very, very special status. So this is going to be our focus for our lectures during uh, this uh, next uh, two weeks and uh, three weekends until uh, April 11. We, uh, I, I hope you have the brochure, and we will follow uh, each topic, answering all the questions regarding uh, which, which was stated in the brochure. One of the big problem which I as a scholar see, why there are so many divergent views, why Christians differ on the matter of who Jewish people are, what is the destiny, the uh, significance, the status of Israel, how it's related to God's overall picture in history, is that we have problem with our definitions. What is chosen? What is the covenant? What is actually Israel? And who are the Jews? Well, this is why today we will start with the subject which I called Who is Who on a Stage of Biblical History. People are confused in terminology. And in order to help you uh, systematize, I placed the terms in their historic order. Hebrews, Israelites, Judeans, Palestinians, Jews. Who is who? The key is in, Hebrew, in history. And the way how history is directly connected with the Bible. So let us start unwrapping each of the term in its progression. We start with Hebrews. Because the first time the word Hebrew occurs in the Bible is in this verse. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. What is it talking about? We need to go even deeper into the history. So let us go to the beginning, to the story which many people know. It is the story of the construction of the Tower of Babel. So, Bible records to us that this way, that the people had one language and one speech, and it happened right after, it happened, that, you know, the story is uh, basically next, uh, following the flood, so they are told after the flood to uh, feel the earth, but they congregated in the land of Sinar, and they started a construction. They wanted to build the city and the tower which would reach to the top of heavens. 
And of course it was done because they wanted to take precautions not to be flooded again, which definitely represents the gross mistrust into the core promise of the covenant of God. You know, at the very end of the flood, when Noah came out of the ark and uh, brought up the sacrifices, God said, I will not bring any more floods to, the, to destroy the entire earth. So that one is basically, God, we don't believe you. We trust our own ability to construct something. And so they started. And so the Lord had to take a look at the construction process. And he realized that they're going to build something which would become a center of the world empire. And this wasn't in his plans. And of course, he wasn't about to destroy that generation. But he decided to make some correction. And what he does is he says, OK, they have one language, and he wants to prevent them from understanding each other. And so he comes down and confuses their language, and they stop understanding each other's speech. This story is extremely important in the understanding and proof of the historicity of the biblical story, especially the stories for, uh, which are recorded in Genesis 1 to 11. And the reason why uh, we cannot have, we don't have much proof of the creation. We do have evidences of the flood, but unfortunately, depending on what people believe about the flood, they interpret these evidences differently. Some people say this wasn't the worldwide flood, this was some kind of a ice age or something like this. So there is a difference of opinion. But this story is interesting because there is no difference of opinion in regards to the languages of the world. You see, if you look here, you will see a, a finite number. You see the different colors. They represent, uh, I didn't count, but a, a, a finite number of the world language families. What is the world language family? Well, let's think it this way. You have Germanic English, uh, languages that include English, uh, Danish, uh, Swedish, Norwegian, you know, German, Dutch. That's Germanic. Well, but then you have Romance language, yeah, languages. You have French, Spanish, Italian, Romanian. So uh, you have also uh, Persian language, uh, well, Slavic languages, for example, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, Czech, Bulgarian. Then you can go into uh, Persian languages, you know, Farsi, the Kurdish language, the Tajik. So, these are the groups, 
But it is very interesting that I, call, I named these groups, and there is, these groups have, have certain linguistic traits and sometimes the words are being borrowed from one language to another, you know? Even there are some Russian words in English, such as Sputnik, <laughs> right? Although there is a perfect word for satellite, but Sputnik <laughs> came into English, right? And if I say mama, everybody will understand whether you're French speaking, whether you're English speaking, whether you're German speaking, uh, or Russian speaking, because it comes from the common roots. In fact, both the word for mother and father come from Persian. Mama means madar, the gift from moon, and father, papa, means padar, the gift from uh, son. So, this is what is called here the Indo-European family of languages. But if you go like, for example, see this green, this is already a different family. This is called Altai family of languages, which includes Turkish languages, a number of Turkic languages, and other, and, and they're not related. There is no common uh, roots, you know. I, I tell you, I've tried to look at Turkish language and other languages. I heard them, you know, Kazakh, Uzbek. I have no idea. This is just so absolutely different. And so what you have here, all these families of languages on the world map with different color that and it is linguistically proven. In fact, it was a curator of Hermitage Museum, the communist man, Igor Dyakonov, who studied these languages, and he actually came up with this, uh, uh, with this linguistic theory about the certain root languages that have nothing in common. So, that's, that's the Bible. This is how it works. So, but let us go back into the narrative of the Bible. And by narrative, I mean that the Bible is not just, cannot be read by a, a, a sec, separate verses. We can't just single out verse here, verse there. We need to look at the general uh, context. So what happens here? Here is our Tower of Babel story. And next, right after that, right after uh, verse 8, we have a big genealogy list. Don't try to squint your eyes. I'm just, it's not for reading. I'm just showing you <laughs> how the flow of the Bible text goes. So you have the Tower of Babel, and then you have the genealogy of the sons of Noah. But what's before the Tower of Babel? Before the Tower of Babel, look, again, the genealogy of the sons of Noah. You see what is happening? You have this genealogy surrounding the Tower of Babel story. You have the list of names, genealogy, then the Tower of Babel story, then again the list of names. Why? What is happening? More interesting, look at this. You see in red, names of the sons of Shem, the descendants of Shem, and particularly Arpaxad, Sala, Eber, Peleg. And look, this is your Genesis 10. 
But look at the Genesis 11, and you see the same names. This is strange, isn't it? Well, so this is how the general flow of the biblical narrative goes. I just put it in a different diagram. And again, the question is, why, is, why are these repetitions? Let us observe. And here's what we can see when we observe. We see a very interesting situation. This is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. I spend, I don't know how many hours, building this Noah family tree on one small PowerPoint slide. Oh, anyway, I couldn't fit everybody, but I think I fit 95% of name here. But this is a tree, you see? You have main branches here, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then you have the sons of Japheth and the further generations of Japheth, the sons of Ham, and the further generations of Ham. And then you have Shem. You see, Shem has five sons, but there is one line here that goes. You see, I put it in red. Always oh, see, Eber is recorded to have two sons, and boy, this Joktan really, really have many children. But there is this line that goes. This line in Genesis chapter 10 ends here, Peleg. Peleg, it uh, says, because the land was divided, and that's when the Tower of Babel project failed. So these names here do not appear in the, on the genealogy of Genesis 10, but they do appear very clearly on the linear genealogy of Genesis 11. You see, Genesis 10 gives everybody and his brother, literally. <laughs> But Genesis 11 selects only one son of Shem, only one son of Arpaxad, only one son of Eber, and it builds up nicely 10 generations which culminate in Abram. Who are these 10 generations? Why are these people, these names mentioned here? Except those in the block I kind of showed you to demonstrate. And why are they repeated here? Most scholars concur that by these repetitions, uh, Moses wanted to demonstrate a generation of people, uh, well, not a generation, but a successive generations of specific people, specific descendants of Noah, specific descendants of uh, Shem, which did not come to build the tower. It means their language was not confused. They retained the original language. So, who these people were? Let us take a look. 
It says at the end of Genesis 11 that Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And then something happens. Terah takes his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law uh, Sarai and his sons Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. What is actually happening here? We need some map here. This is the map of the ancient Near East in the second millennium. And Terah is intending to come right here to the land of Canaan. And he lives here, but he goes in a very strange route. From the lower Mesopotamia, or he goes up all the way here into this mountainous city of Haran, and he stays here. Let me show the trip again. Why is this happening? The main reason for it is that, as you see on the physical map, this is the driest desert in the world. If he was to go straight to, to cut the corner, he would really, really, really get in troubles and lo lost all of his livestock. So there is only one way to go from the area of Mesopotamia, lower Mesopotamia is the Babylonia. The only one way to go is through what is known as Fertile Crescent that follows the river Euphrates. And that's where in the, at the Fertile Crescent, all the civilization, you see the map of the world civilization. This is, this is the cradle of the world civilization. Goes like a, actually a crescent or sickle from River Nile down to Mesopotamia. This is where the events are actually taking place. So it says here that Terach, the father of Abram, actually went up to here in Haran and stopped proceeding with his journey. The question is why? And that's the key question that will help you to understand the origin of the term Hebrew. And we will answer this question after the short break. Okay, I promised to answer your question, to answer you a question, why <clears throat> Terach, the son of, uh, the father of Abraham, did not proceed further than this place. But there is basically a series of questions which have to be asked and answered. 
First of all, why is it that the family of Terah even set out to this journey? So, in order to answer this question, we need to continue studying our narrative of the book of Genesis in order to get the details we need. And the book of Genesis chapter 12 starts. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I, will, that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. So the two statements here in red are very important. God is asking Abram to leave his country and his family so that out of him would be a new country and a new family. So, this goes back to the question which I hear sometimes, oh, Abraham is the first Jew. Well, not exactly correct. But it says in the Bible that Abraham is the first Hebrew. But the question which is important, because people always think that Hebrews and Jews is the same thing, it is actually not the same thing. And uh, this is why it is important for us to understand what the Hebrew means, because Abraham belonged to some country and belonged to some nation before out of him the new nation was created. So which nation did Abram belong to? The answer is very clear. The book of Deuteronomy 26, 5 says, that my father was a wandering Aramean. Who are the Arameans? Well, Arameans are uh, a people who actually lived in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the land that lay, that, that's a fertile land that is located between two rivers, uh, which is Tigris and uh, Euphrates. And on the modern map, that will be Iraq and Syria. And this particular land was actually uh, a home for several uh, nations. In particular, we have here the most ancient nation, Sumerians, and also Babylonians, but we also have Arameans that are sort of divided between two major clans. They're kind of split. There are southern Arameans, and there are northern Arameans. These southern Arameans 
they settle around the city of Ur, and uh, they are called Chaldeans. Actually, later on in history, if you jump about uh, 1,200 years from the period of patriarchs of Abraham into a sixth century BC, you will discover that Chaldeans got an upper hand in Babylon and established their dynasty with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who was a Chaldean by nationality, but he became the king over the entire Babylon and created a Neo-Babylonian empire. But again, Arameans are one of the several nations that live in Mesopotamia, and they are living in two pockets. The southern one are Chaldeans, and the northern one are called Syrians. This is the same thing. Don't, don't confuse it with today's Syria, which is uh, called uh, correctly Syrian Arabic Republic, or the Arabic Republic of Syria. In fact, the majority of the population of Syria are uh, today, due to the history which dates 1200, uh, maybe 1400 years ago, uh, are uh, Arab-speaking people, and uh, they're basically uh, Sunni and Shia Muslims, that's why there is a civil war, but bit among them, we have a several Christian groups. These are, they're known as Assyrian Christians. They're, they're the ones who are being terribly, horribly perse persecuted today and killed off. And they actually speak the ancient Aramaic language. In fact, if you trace, if the original language is Aramaic, um, I mean, it's uh, really a providence that uh, Yeshua, Jesus, spoke Aramaic. And so it is very interesting that the people, there are pockets of villages, they're Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians, and they speak the language similar to the one uh, spoken by Jesus. And, uh, but when we're back 18th century BCE, before the Christian era, now we understand why Terach, who was the Aramean from the south, felt pretty comfortable staying up here in a country which speaks his language and uh, holds his customs, and he did not want to go to an absolutely foreign land because here in this land, the, uh, the sons of Cam settled. And, but God indeed had a specific plan for the descendants of Shem who did not participate in the construction of the Tower of Babel. The plan was to actually settle right here, and what you see here on the map is the maps of all king, ancient kingdoms and civilizations. And you see the Babylonia, the Syria, the Hittite, the Egyptian. And you see in red, there are ancient uh, trade routes, the caravan highways. And look at this. You see the density of the highways here? If you look at the map of the United States, you look at Nebraska, 
and it's only Highway 70 and Highway 80, right? <laughs> Kansas, <laughs> one highway, but look at Southern California. If on the Atlas it's gonna be all red, you won't, you know, it's highway, 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 and everybody's stopped. <laughs> Nobody's going, right? You go the same uh, across to New, New York, New Jersey, I-95 corridor. Again, highway, 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 everybody stopped. <laughs> right? So this is where God wanted his people to be. This is where God wanted the people who remained faithful to him, who did not participate in construction of the Tower of Babel to be, to become the messengers, to become the heralds of God's truth. Because remember, we talked about this from the very beginning. The very reason for construction of the Tower of Babel was that people did not trust God. That handful of pe people did not trust that God would come through with his promise not to bring flood. Only that handful of people, you know, through, and, and, and even though one was, you know, the son of the other, but they lived long enough, you probably, if you read the genealogy, you will realize that Abraham lived during the time when Shem was still alive. Look at your Bibles, you will see that. So, God wanted them here to actually be the messengers of his truth so that people could learn to trust him. God wanted that family here before, and I'm uh, now using the ancient Near Eastern sources, before the pagan mythology took a deep root in the minds of the people. God wanted his people here positioned at the crossroads of all the trade routes. So, but we know that Terach didn't go completely. And what we have, the evidences show Jewish tradition based on the book of Joshua uh, is very clear about Terach fallen into idolatry so that's why God says to Abram, lech lecha, which literally is to be translated, go by yourself. Meaning, without your father, Terach, without your brother, Nahor, go by yourself. Well, we know that Lot joined alone. But Abraham went by himself to fulfill <coughs> the will of God. So why is he called Hebrew? He is called Hebrew. Be in, in the, I, I gave you the Hebrew text here, Abraham Ha'ivri, Avra, uh, it comes from the root, Hebrew root, avar, to cross over, to traverse. What did he cross over? Look at the map, and I show you the arrow here, and you see this blue river. What, tree, what river is this? It's Euphrates. And this is why Joshua says that our fathers behind the river worshipped another gods. So 
Hebrew is actually technically not a nation. Hebrew is someone who makes the decision to cross over, to go over the line, to, take, to go no matter what in order to follow the commandment of God. Well, what about the Israelites? That's the next stage. We know how Israel came about. We know that Abraham, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. We know that Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And basically we start, we begin to see the, the descendants of Abraham being formed out as Hebrews. So Ishmael is Hebrew by genealogy. By birth, he is Hebrew. Esau is Hebrew by birth, but only Jacob is Israel. Because Jacob grabbed the one with whom he had struggle and said to him, I won't let you go no matter what until I get your blessing. He struggled to get the blessing of the Lord. And he got it. And so, the name Israel, Yisrael, from the Hebrew verb Sarah here, to struggle, the name is born. Well, the nation of Israel, it took about 400 years to form, but eventually it was formed into the mighty Davidic kingdom, which lasted for two generations with David and Solomon, but unfortunately, this kingdom, after the death of Solomon, came to its demise and was split between Judah in the south and Israel in the north. So you see how the term Israel throughout the Bible changes? When you read the book of Exodus, Israel are all the people who left Egypt. When you read the book of Kings, Israel is this territory effectively occupied by nine tribes, not 10. Remember that the tribe of Simeon was very small and that then they basically lived among Judeans and dissipated. And this is what we see as the end of the northern kingdom Israel. It says in the book 2 Kings chapter 17, and gives specific date when the king of Assyria besieged the capital of northern Israel, the, the northern kingdom, the Israel Samaria, and he took the 10 tribes away and settled them somewhere in Central Asia. You know, as a, and that's what basically is happening to the northern kingdom. This uh, barrelief found in Nineveh draws the 
picture of the destruction of Samaria. And we have the ruins of Samaria uh, still in the, around the city of Shechem today on the territory known today as Palestinian Authority. Well, the Bible is very clear. The book of Kings is very clearly de defines the reasons why 10 tribes of Israel ceased to exist. And the text here is very clear that there was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. Well, somebody, and, and it's very popular topic, and we will discuss it further in our lectures about whether these 10 tribes can be found. But remember one thing. Before we go on the journey of finding them, we need to look at the Bible to see why they disappeared. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a misfortune. It wasn't some kind of a bad luck. It was divine will after 400 years of sending prophet after prophet, it was a divine will to do something about it. And by the way, we will see in our further lectures that the prophet Jeremiah actually, even a hundred years after the tribes disappeared, attempts to bring them back, but there is no desire. You know why? The main reason why, this, why God did what he did is outlined here. These tribes effectively became pagan. So what's the point? If they're not coming back to God, what's the point of even looking for them? They assimilated for thousands of years. They assimilated with the same pagans. So, this is the story of the ten tribes. And again, we'll talk more about this. But it is very clear, you know, sometimes researchers are finding, oh, there is a tribe in Afghanistan that has this and this and this element of which may resemble some Jewish culture. No way. These people are Muslims. For uh, 1,500 years, they've been Muslims. You're going to tell them that they have some Israelite background and they're going to listen to you? They're going to kill you. Because if they try today to associate themselves with Israel, they will be killed by the neighbors. You know, so this is uh, very specifically in the Bible. It shows that the only tribe that is left is the tribe of Judah. You know, sometimes people ask me, what tribe am I from? I mean, look at the Bible and you'll see. Jews are from the tribe of Judah. Well... Some of them are from the tribe of Levi and even the priestly lineage. As the next period of history demonstrates. The next period of history demonstrates that, you know, Judah went to the Babylonian exile and Judah returned from the Babylonian exile. According to the book of Ezra, here, who comes back from the Babylon, the houses of Judah, the houses of Benjamin, and the priests and Levites. 
we're at the new stage of history. No longer we have any reference to the kingdom of Israel, but we do have a Judea in different political situations. I'm going to show you a little recap of history, all the stages so far. See, this is the period of patriarchs, that's the century. That's the formation of the nation of Israel and the Davidic kingdom. And that's the year when the Israel and Judah split. And that's the year when 10 tribes, well, nine tribes of Israel went captive. And that's when the first temple destroyed. And we have, see, that's from 722 BC, we have the kingdom of Judah. Then we have exile. And then we have temple restored. And what we have is, again, the Judea under different circumstances. We have Judea as the province of Persia. We have Judea under the uh, Greek rule. We have Judea under the Roman rule. And of course, Judea exists effectively until 132 BC. The name Judea exists as a geographical territory, and the people who live in it are called Judeans. And I will tell you the difference between Judeans and Jews in a second. But here we have a geographic territory until the second temple is destroyed. And then, you may not know this, but this is the second rebellion, which happens under the leadership of Bar Kokhba, which really, really makes Roman emperors mad. And what basically he does, what he basically does is he decides to wipe out Judea and Jews from the memory. And so he brings, assembles a council, and he says, all right, what can we do in order to bring the new name for this territory, to make it most offensive? most derogatory to the Jews. And they come out with the name Palestine, the land of Philistines, the arch enemies of Israel since the time of Judges. And this is how the Palestine, as a geographical territory, emerges under the Romans, period under the Byzantine period and continues until the Islamic period. And so what we have here sometimes, people are really anachronistic. When I hear, for example, Jesus walked in Palestine, that's wrong. There was no Palestine when Jesus walked on it. The worst examples I hear, Apostle Peter the Palestinian. Maybe he is Muslim. <laughs> That's what's called anachronism. That's because people do not understand the history. But what about Jews? Well, I want to show you with the interesting text. And we'll come back to it in our further lectures, but look at this. Acts 19, 11, 19. 
talks about the disciples who were scattered after the persecution that arose after the stoning of Stephen. And there is a, an opinion that after the stoning of Stephen, God decided to draw the line and throw Jews into the uh, into that trash dump of history. But this is not what the Bible says. Look at this text. These disciples who scattered from Jerusalem traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to no one but to Jews only. What does it mean? To be very brief, we're dealing with the diaspora. After the Babylonian captivity, Jews never lived unitedly in Judea. That's why I say Judeans, because there are Jews who are not Judeans. There are Jews who, through generations, lived in uh, Rome, in Alexandria, in Tarshish, all across the world, including the Babylon. Remember Esther and Mordecai's story. Right? This is the diaspora. Do you realize today that in the United States we have more Jews living than in Israel? There are about 10 million Jews who live in the United States and Canada alone, whereas there are only 5.5 million Jews who live in Israel. At the time of Jesus, 70% of Jews did not live in Judea. And God is very clear. He sends his messengers to them. He does not throw Jewish people out of history. They exist until today. But the question is, what about those who do not have any genetic connection with Jewish people? These words of Paul may be very encouraging. Look at this. You see, sometimes it's even look kind of funny. I know many Christians who want to have spiritual connections with Israel, and I've seen a very interesting situation several times. A, you know, a Jamaican uh, minister walks into the office of a Jewish lawyer, Orthodox Jewish lawyer, and during the conversation, he says, you know, I am a Jew. And this Jewish lawyer gives a look, what? Like, if you call yourself a Jew, who am I? Well, the Bible is very clear about any one spiritual connection. Jesus ties everybody in Abraham. You know why? Because of the meaning of the word Hebrew which indicates faithfulness, trust, and resolve to follow the will of God to the end. This is what the example of Abraham is, is all about for everyone. Well, not everyone of the Abraham descendants followed. 
And that's why it makes its, this statement is double-edged sword. Ishmael was a descendant of Abraham. Esau was a descendant of Abraham, and he sold his faith for a pot of lentils. If you want to be the seed of Abraham, you need to have a resolve. And the example of Jacob will not be missed. Do you, are you willing to have that resolve? To grab and to follow, no matter what happens in your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so glad that you show us examples throughout the Bible, examples of your faithful people out of whom you build your followers. Lord, we want to be part of this faithful group. We want to be those Hebrews willing to cross over, trusting in you. We want to follow the example of Jacob and grab and beg for your blessing and receive it. We want to follow the example of a generation of every faithful Judean and a Jew who were not afraid to return from Babylon to the destruction and ashes of their houses in, the fall, in their falling of the will of God. And those who followed their Messiah, Jesus, to the end, which often resulted in death through Roman execution. Help us, Lord, to see the examples of these people who had resolved to be faithful to you and help us to be faithful to you as the true Hebrews. Amen. I would like to invite Elena Solo uh, back to the stage for one more song tonight.
You know, it's always great when we can be blessed with uh, exceptional music that turns our hearts towards God. Now tonight, as we get ready to close the program, um, I hope you put your name, registered yourself, but I know for a fact that 80 people did not register themselves, so I'm sorry, you are not going to win this tonight. Okay? Sorry about that. Maybe next time. Um, however, I do have a card that we're going to hand out um, right now, if I can have my young people come and give me a hand. We have a card we'd like you to uh, take a time. If you have a question about the program tonight, or you have a question in general, write it on the back of the card. On the front of the card, we collect data at the start of the program. This one just talks about your religious affiliation or non-religious affiliation. It's simply so that we know who is here, whether you're uh, Baptist, Apostolic, Adventist, Catholic, Jewish, Pentecostal, Messianic, Mormon, non-denominational, atheist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So if you take a moment, circle the one on the front, and they're gonna pick that up from you when you leave, and when you leave, you are each gonna be able to walk out of here tonight with this book, True Believer, and they will hand that to you as you leave. I would like to add, invite Dr. Uh, doctor, you just got a uh, new degree, Pastor Alex Parashuk to the platform because we have to do a drawing for a book. And it's called the Jewish Annotated New Testament. I have a, lit, a box here with everybody that did turn in their name. I'll mix it up a little bit and then I'm going to let him draw it and state the name and we will give out this Bible. Right now, they're only mixed up a little bit. Oh, I think I forgot to sign up. I don't want him to cheat and pick his own name. And the individual is Audrey Lang. Audrey, are you here? Oh, she's upstairs. Okay. Audrey, um, I will give it to you. I'll have Kayleen. Would you come here and take this, please? Oh, Windows got it. Audrey's wearing a red shirt. Upstairs. She's upstairs. I would like uh, Professor, Professor, hey, you get another promotion. Pastor Parashuk to close with. More, more? I like <laughs> Close with prayer in Russian tonight, and then I'll close in English. Я хотел бы поприветствовать всех русскоговорящих. I apologize for English speaking people. Uh, все, кто прошел, и надеюсь, что перевод был достаточно хороший. Я думаю, дальнейшие встречи мы будем продолжать в этом формате. Завтра я приготовлю и вам раздадут список всех тем и все расписание на три недели. И также, может быть, некоторые другие детали. Let's bow the head and we pray. Небесный Отец, Всемогущий Господь и Бог наш, мы благодарим Тебя за эти встречи, мы благодарим Тебя за то, как в истории Ты сохранял познание о себе через народ израильский, Господь. Ты сохранил нам то понимание спасения, которое Ты дал нам через Спасителя. И сегодня Ты всех нас объединяешь в эту семью духовного Израиля. И мы хотим понимать Тебя, Твою волю, Твои действия. И помоги нам на этом семинаре быть открытыми к воздействию Святого Духа Твоего. Благослови всех нас, ибо мы просим во имя Иисуса Христа. Аминь. Lord God of the universe, we thank you for allowing us to come here and hear your word, to allow us to draw closer to you. And Lord, as we leave here tonight, allow us to travel safely and come back tomorrow and to hear more about Israel yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen.
Have a great and wonderful evening. Make sure you turn in your card as you walk out, and please make sure you get a book. We'll see you tomorrow night.